This is Yesterzine, where we rejudge a magazine's best and worst rated games and dive deeper to find out what games coverage was like when there was so much new to play that SimCity could be only the fifth best game that month. It's not going to be the only oddity in this issue though as we look at Amiga Computing issue 22, badged as volume 2 issue 10, from May 1990. Because I've chosen this one for a reason. If you, like all right thinking people, also subscribe to Rhodes Tinted Spectrum, you may remember late last year he looked at Amiga favourite Xenon 2 and declared it impossible to review these days. A visual and audio showcase, Xenon 2's gameplay is not universally considered to have aged well, and no one is changing their mind on their view of it. Rewind five months though, and Amiga Computing lost their actual mind. And I'm not even talking about their review of New Zealand Story, where they gave it 49% while saying absolutely nothing critical about the game at all, and instead turning the review into a concept piece about travelling back five years and basically implying that platform games were old hat in 1989, before the releases of either Super Mario Bros. 3 or any of the Sonics. Platform games over and done before the first turn of the decade in home video games then, but apparently not shooting games, literally the oldest type of games. I say this because they reviewed Xenon 2 that month and gave it 100%. Xenon 2's mum doesn't think it deserves 100%. So you might reasonably ask, why we're doing issue 22 then? If Amiga Computing has already had their Commodore format moment. It's mainly because they haven't. There's a 100% review in this issue too about which I have thoughts. But you'll need to wait for the feature to hear them, because somehow that game is not our gaming heaven, because there is a shoot 'em up that gets 109%. What even are numbers? It's a neat solution to having hastily given 100% to a style over substance average shooter certainly, but is this new one just prettier and music-y, uh? or is it actually in some way good? You almost wonder what would make Amiga Computing dislike a shooter on that basis, and we've got good news there too, because the gaming hell is one. I'm not sure I want to know what a shooter 74% worse than Xenon 2 is like, but we're all going to find out. First though, what does 9% better than perfect even look like? So how did we get here? Well, millions of years ago, the Earth was without form and void. And then late last year, someone asked lovely human Rose Tinted Spectrum to do a review of Xenon 2 on the Amiga. Yeah, I think that's all the major events. Oh, and someone in the middle invented the wheel and taught sand to think, both of which were probably mistakes. Rosie discovered it a tricky job. Xenon 2 lived and died, like so many Bitmap Brothers games, on transformative sound and visuals. The soundtrack, derived from Mega Blast by Bomb the Bass, itself derived from music from the film Assault on Precinct 13, is iconic enough to overshadow the game itself. In the video, a talented and handsome man played the Amiga format reviewer who gave it 93%, but somehow that wasn't the biggest overreaction. Amiga Computing went 7 better and effectively declared it the perfect game. Their reasoning is tricky to determine. The entire review makes so little sense that Rosie ends that video by doing a dramatic reading of the entire thing. In the spaceways of centuries yet to come, there is nothing, do you hear? Nothing you can do. Essentially though, the first 97% of the review is entirely a rant supposedly by the villain of the game that you'd think was just copied from the manual if the manual had any such thing. The only facts provided was the game came on two discs and that the music exists. And then they give it 100%. And 10 in every subcategory too. I think Jeff Walker might have been bombing a little too much bass, if you know what I mean. Speaking personally, I've never been a big fan of the game. Although Amiga Format knocking a full 61% off the score for their re-review exactly three years later seems harsh. It is slow. It plods and is way too happy about throwing no win dead end scenarios at you until you've memorised the strict route through the level. It's still clever, mind, but it's probably the poster child for the bitmap's occasional tendency to disappear down we can do this technical wankery. 
You can illustrate this very well by the application of this, the Sega Master System version. While still a marvel for the machine, shorn of the immediate wow factor, the game is laid bare rather and its shortcomings multiplied. The Master System is weirdly well served for shooters, even more so past its commercial life, and there are very few people who would choose it over the likes of Power Strike, R-Type or Pigorous these days. The Amiga though, they're all horizontal in my brain, other than the perhaps Swiv. In this issue though, we have one of each orientation, and they're the top and bottom game, and they're reviewed by the same chap, although it's not Jeff Walker. So without further ado, let me present all 109% of Battle Squadron. And you know what? It's not striding in, bombing up the base or anything, but that's not bad at all for a 1989 Amiga title. It's also telling you a lot more about the story than Zenon 2's manual did but a lot less than Amiga Computing's review made up about it. The story itself is… well it exists. Two commanders went missing, taken hostage, go blow things up until they're not hostages anymore and can go back to being in their 1980s new rock band. The intro gives a clue to the first problem I encountered though. When I started the game and held the button down to shoot, I would very frequently accidentally activate the smart bomb power up. The game assumes you have one button, even when it knows you have two, and holding down the main fire button and doing what it interprets as a circle will set it off. It's also wrong to be holding down the button as it turns out, so I'll gloss over that and skip to my next goes instead. Switching from joystick to joypad and hammering the button in a way that was near impossible on my Micro Switch to Competition Pro really improves the situation, and we can start to actually look at the game. Initially, it gives a very yet another shooter impression, although atmospherically the music soon kicks in and then 15 seconds later you're playing a game. If you know this game, you also know what I just did wrong, but we'll come back to that. For now though, there's a really decent amount going on, lots of different enemies, some nice attack patterns and plenty of opportunities for enemies to surprise you. I'm famously not great at these games, but there are times I wonder if I'm not just bad at stupid shooters and crappy bosses because generally in this one it's playing fair and I'm doing okay. Or at least I'm very aware exactly where it is I'm buggering up. Another word for that sound though. The music and sound effects playing together, which wasn't a given for early Amiga games at all, are very console-like, which is a huge compliment. There's also a decent amount of bass and impact to it even on my monitor speakers. I keep playing, soon finding a way into the inner planet, which seems to be what it considers the end of a level, even though you can play on by avoiding the icon. The sequence isn't skippable, which is irritating, and marks a fairly pointless downtime to a relentless action title. Inside the planet, things do get harder, and I start to realise what this game was trying to teach me, that you should use your smart bombs. It's what they're there for. It's generous with giving the things out, and they destroy the bullets heading your way as well. It's using the smart bomb in the next game where I discover my mistake. These truck chaps contain your shot upgrades, and as soon as I start to know that, I'm away. Once you have the tools at your disposal, the game opens up. The amount of destruction you can cause is very impressive and satisfying in a way that Amiga shooters didn't always manage. In the nicest way, it feels like a console title, and it was not a surprise to later find out there's an EA published Mega Drive port, albeit a rare one. It's a hoot. I've not played this much of a shooter in a very long time that isn't a less adjacent and on a master system, and I'm going to play a lot more of it. I'm not even sure how deep it is, but there's multiple routes and every game I'm discovering a new trick, a new enemy, a new weapon upgrade. The review of course is in a quandary. It's clear from the start our host Stuart C. Russell is not quite as enamoured of Xenon 2 as his colleagues. For a start, he sneaks in a dig at an insipid tune licensed from somewhere else, which can only mean Mega Blast, which to this point he hasn't actually named. Other than that, he doesn't even go into as much detail as I have, praising the enemies and their mix of slow and bullet sponge combined with fast and fragile, as well as suggesting that if you stuck an Amiga in a box in an arcade, this wouldn't look out of place. He's right of course, but people might notice when they tried to put the coins in. 
There's no trick to that 109% score. He simply says Xenon 2 is 100% and this is better. He's half right. This is at least 9% better than Xenon 2. I'll double that. But 109% is of course a nonsense. That said, if like me you hadn't played or even heard of this, then it's time to fix that even if you're just a casual shooter fan. It's one of those games that simply feels a step above its contemporaries. It's not just Amiga Computing either. The One didn't review it until its 1993 re-release, but even at four years old they described it as the most satisfying out and out shooter they'd seen in a long while. Amiga Format gave it 11% less than they gave Xenon 2 on original release. But while they took 61% off Xenon 2 when they re-reviewed it, they actually added 4 to their original score for this. And they're right. Xenon 2 aged like a mullet milkshake once its technical charms were no longer quite as remarkable. This? This plays exactly as well as it did in 1989, and I'm sure the developers went on to great- oh no, this was their last game. In fact, they only ever made this and similar shooter Hybris, which Amiga Computing also praised and you can bet I'll be trying. Why that is I don't know, although their name Copecom just sounds like a Street Fighter player trying to convince themselves that there will ever be a better one than number 2. Still, in the space of a couple of days I've gone from thinking there might only be one really good Amiga vertical shooter, to thinking that number is possibly at least 3. Having painted themselves into a corner with that 100% for Xenon 2, at least Amiga Computing knew not to make that mistake ever again- oh for Super Frog's sake they've done it again. Amiga Computing gave three figure percentage marks thrice in their life, and both of them that aren't Xenon 2 are in this issue. But this time we're on my turf, because it is Stunt Car Racer by Jeff Crammond. If you watch Yesterzine and have a memory, or played driving games in the 90s, or listened to me talk about them for more than 4.2 seconds, then the name Jeff Crammond will be familiar. Primarily these days, Jeff is well known for the title that invented proper simulation, Formula 1 Grand Prix, or if you're American, World Circuit was the first that really gets to call itself a Formula 1 game. Oh sure, games had claimed to be that before, but this was the first with every circuit, the first with every team, the first that could put a full 26 cars on the track at the same time, the first where you had a fighting chance of recognising where you even were. As the F1 fan tween age game player I cannot begin to explain its importance. This is simulation driving game Doom, it's Street Fighter 2, it's Super Mario World. It was so far ahead of everything else that Amiga Power generally a lot harder on games that required thinking the most, dubbed him Sir Jeff Crammond, an honour they never bestowed on any other developer. That was still two years away though. What we have here is simpler and less well remembered, although for those who do, nearly as fondly so. Here we don't have real world tracks and we don't have 25 opponents. We do though have the kind of freedom not having to deal with those things provides. Stunt Car Racer is a head to head racing game based on a round robin 3 driver leagues. You will race both your opponents on both of that division's tracks and they will also race each other. A win is 2 points, fastest lap is a point, best driver goes up a division, worst driver goes down and repeat. The tracks in Stunt Car Racer are as implied by its name. They are roller coasters. One of them is literally roller coaster, in fact. In Division 4, your two routes are the Humpback and the Little Ramp, both named after their most defining feature. And I know what you're thinking no, I don't have any additional comment to make about the phrase Humpback. With tracks like this, the game is going to live or die on its driving dynamics, and Stunt Car Racer in this respect is aidlessly brilliant. Seconds after you're dropped onto the little ramp track, you apply some of your limited boost and you're hurtling towards a banked corner at 170 miles an hour trying to get the whole shot. Throwing it into that corner you'd swear you can feel it jump, slip and drift and then correcting that as you re-enter the straight, bounced back across the track by the returning camber. Five seconds in and with only digital controls you're already feeling like a driving god as your car bounces on its incredibly modelled suspension. 
No time to celebrate though, because up comes the centerpiece, and you need to have built up decent speed to make the jump safely as the track completely disappears beneath you. Again, the game is making you feel like a genius as you nail this, sailing through the air with the greatest of ease. The rest of Little Ramp is somewhat simpler, and you may wish to save your boost for the main straight and making the jump. You can't relax though. Stunt Car Racer is a game that'll bite you for the slightest loss of concentration. No big jumps on the humpback, but with enough speed you can pretty much create one. But again, the small gap might get you, and falls off the track cost me two wins and the chance of promotion first time. It's pretty easy on these circuits to ensure you at least get fastest lap, as there's more than enough boost to get you down the straights, and the AI will not be able to live with that. This is also how you'll beat them without taking risks in the tricky sections. It's at this point I need to make something clear. I was obsessed with this game age 12, it is still a bloody good drive now. I very much enjoy the misspelled practice mode and the early division or two, as well as the tracks within. It is a travesty that this game never got an official expansion, sequel, remake or even really any unofficial more modern knockoff. The actual driving experience of the thing due to the more dynamic nature of it is possibly even better than F1 GP. Almost all of this also applies to the other versions, even the humble monochromatic spectrum one is still incredible. And having made that clear, let me rip this thing apart. It's at Division 3 we start to see the issue. It comes up in the first course, Big Ramp, not so much for the Big Ramp itself but for the two little ones. You need to take the first one at a very specific speed in order to land in a fit state to take the second one at correct speed. Amiga Format would cover this in a tip section later. Big Ramp only works if you enter that first little ramp at about 170 miles an hour. The next course is worse. The Stepping Stones has, as its name might suggest, a series of tiny step ramps. There's no time to sort yourself out here. You need to enter around 140 and just boost yourself up a bit if it falls too much from there. Get this wrong and you'll be picking yourself up off the floor. Or rather the nice man with the crane will. Which means the only way to gain time on this is on the rest of the course, making this at times a drive a normal track quick and then cruise at preset speed simulator. The actual game is happening on the boring bits. Worse, if you find yourself alongside an AI at these tricky sections, one unfortunate nudge in midair and your season can effectively be over. It gets worse too if you look at the top of the screen. The crack slowly making its way across is a damage indicator. If it reaches the end, then your race is over. Not so bad, but a proper crash, the kind of thing that could easily be doing 109 miles an hour on the stepping stones or getting nudged by the AI at the top of a ramp, can put a hole in it. While your damage is repaired between races, the holes are there for the life of the game and permanently reduce your durability. In practice for me, this made the later courses undrivable. With just one hole and with no actual crashes, I couldn't finish three laps at the Division 1 course of the ski jump just from the collective damage of the landings from the big jump. The game doesn't have any options like F1 GP for turning off or reducing damage, so you're stuck with it. Ski jump isn't even the worst track. The other Division 1 track, Drawbridge, moves, and the guide suggests to gun it when it's half up, which of course only works if it's half up anywhere near the point where you get to it. I'm not sure I finished a race here. To be fair to this game, this is what you find out when you've played something on and off for 30 years. If this had been the standard amount of time I've played a game, then it's more than possible I'd have noticed none of this. I'd probably not even have seen Division 2. For all I know, 5 seconds after I finish playing Battle Squadron it turns into a match 3 freemium puzzle game designed to empty the wallets of inattentive parents. Amiga Computing are professionals though, they should have noticed some of this especially without access to that guide to the correct speeds. They could have rated it high, but 100% seems barely more justified here than with Xenon 2. This is not to suggest, for even a second, that if you have even the slightest interest in driving games, you shouldn't be playing this immediately. Hell, this game isn't about racing, really. The AI is just a glorified time limit most of the time. You can practice all the courses as soon as the thing boots and this is at least as good an option. Drive them. Read the tips from AF I'll link in the description. 
It's just lovely and has vehicle dynamics some modern games could learn a thing from. Sir Jeff indeed. Before we go into the gaming hell, and in no way an effort to put off talking about it, a history break. It's 1990, when hardware was beige and smoked lid was a luxury feature of your disc box. Commodore were showing off a new Amiga 500 based CD system in secret. Given this would become the Amiga CDTV, that is probably where it should have stayed. The unit would not appear for a year, and when it did it cost considerably more than the $600 promised, launching in America at $999. For us it was less bad. We're still in the days when the UK had yet to spend a decade showing its ass to the world, and employing its chancellors from the local preschool. So we still had a currency, making the machine £500 here thanks to favourable exchange rates. That's still £1,250 in inflation enhanced cash though, for an A500 that required add-ons to play A500 games, and for some reason ran on a four year old version of the Amiga's kickstart. The outside world ignored it. Then Amiga owners waited for a CD drive add-on which did appear, but didn't work on Commodore's new A600. They sold 30,000 CD TVs in the UK, and Computer Gaming World kindly described the whole endeavour as a fiasco. Essentially, Commodore never recovered. Still, it's not all gloom, because at least Commodore never followed through with a bizarre plan to buy the stillborn Conix Multi System, a games console inside a controller that was basically already an A500 but worse. We told that story a year or two back, but to say Commodore would have probably been their most competent owner, and the developer quote that sticks in my head is, it was not very good at anything, probably covers it. Elsewhere, Jeff, Xenon 2 is a perfect game walker, is looking for a C interpreter. Having read that review, I suspect the other staff hid it from him. Commodore sell their 200,000th Amiga in the UK, and I can't tell you which of these gentlemen is the hip young thing buying this rad and cutting edge computing machine, and which of them is the regional sales manager giving him an exciting prize, which includes items like Deluxe Paint 2, Super Bass, a BBC emulator for some reason, and a mouse mat. DMA Design announced the Monster Cartridge, essentially an action replay style cheat cartridge for the Amiga. They couldn't get it to work. Someone else could, and Daytel bought that one instead. Still, that did leave David Jones in need of a project, so he went to work on some new game called Lemmings instead. Finally, and this might date the whole section more than any other, Computers are now in a full quarter of British homes. That figure today, even after home computer usage has arguably peaked, is 88%. Now, this one was tricky to track down. The gaming hell here, which Amiga Computing have helpfully decided to include literally no screenshots of, is called Hellraiser. It's not though, is it? That would be way too easy. There is a 1989 Amiga shooter called Hell Raider, which came out to a welcome so bad, Amiga, give it 35% for being able to boot action, only gave it 40. Careful reading of the review suggests that's not this game. The review points out that the box calls it Hellraiser, but the title screen calls it Liberator. There is an Amiga shooter called Liberator, but it's an Amiga PD shooter from 1992, so probably isn't our man either. The answer does not reflect especially well on Amiga computing, given they've just complained about people getting names wrong. The game we're looking for is Hell Space Razors, according to its title screen. Something apparently none of the magazines got right, even the games machine who reviewed it twice. The menu screen proves we're right, as Amiga Computing were only one letter off describing it as Liberator. Understandably I've lost the will to live at this point. No one has a box scan. Amiga Computing print one that says Hellraiser. My Pi based emulation image has a very similar one that calls it Hell Space Razor on the front, wrong, and Hellraiser's on the spine, wrong. Notably, the screenshots from both Lemon and Amiga and this image show a platform game of some sort and not a shooter, but I can explain that because the first part of the game requires you to corridor shoot your way to the ship, which will be a simple matter 
of walking over here and crap. A simple matter of walking over here and ha, gotcha. So just jump over crap. Let's duck and just let him fly over crap. And that's game over. I hope you enjoyed your horizontally scrolling shooter. The worst part of it is, exploring the corridor over the gap, we reach a dead end. There's no way through here. This is not a lift. Anyone want to guess the answer before I do? And no, it's not to go and play something else. Anything else. Not even something that doesn't put the name of a game that isn't this one across nearly half its single player area. The correct answer, as your mum will tell you, is to go down. In most games, this would kill you. But here is the correct way forward and takes you to this teleporter. We continue to remember our lessons as youngsters and keep working our way lower, which after several shootouts that take all but one of our lives, finally gets us to the hangar. Right, now to try out this horizontally scrolling shooter. I'm sure there's a lot of varied and exciting old bollocks. Ball sacks. This continues. The random nature of the corridor section enemies and their tendency to spawn right on the edge of screens means it's several more goes before I get to the hangar again. And when I do, it goes a little something like this, as I get lucky with shots and simply stroll past the enemies like they're not there. And we get to play a bit of shooting. It lasts about three seconds. Hitting the wall there actually took a life, and it doesn't take long for someone else to get a shot in. Next time, again after several corridor failings, is this one. And yes, that erratic speed isn't me. The game just runs like that. And sounds like that. And plays like that. And you do, in a very real sense, pray for the sweet release of death. I get one solid go at the side-scroller section, having miraculously got through the corridor unscathed. This is it, full and unedited. I do try it on this entirely legit Amiga, licensed exactly as much from Commodore as the next leading alternative. That has an option to do unlimited lives. Unfortunately, this game is badly programmed, and on a faster Amiga runs entirely too quick. Yes, the 1200 didn't yet exist, but 030 Amigas certainly did, even if they weren't super common. It does not improve my mood. Playing it with infinite lives, having capped the CPU to A500 speeds, and it plays like it did on the other machine. The speed is massively variable. The game seemingly slowing down and speeding up based purely on the effort required to do incredibly tricky game things like draw a bullet or move the player. I play to the first boss, who has the personality and impact of a leak in a container of vanilla flavoured blancmange. He is dispatched with less drama than an episode of Dougie, and then we're back in the corridor. You know what, we might have seen enough here. This is not a high quality shooting game. I agree, it probably is 74% worse than Xenon 2. And I'm not sure I'd give Xenon 2 74%. If you'd told me this was a half completed PD game, I'd have believed you. In fact, there was that PD game, wasn't there? Liberator by Mark Sheiky. And so we switch to a third virtual Amiga in as many minutes as I find a floppy image and shove it into WinUAE. First impressions are strong. That's a nice tune and a title screen that knows what the game is called is a distinct improvement. The game? Well, the game isn't good. But it's better than Hellraisers at least. And it'd cost you 20 quid less to boot. Plus, you can get straight in and start shooting, which is nice because it doesn't have lives and one touch is death. And one touch is easy because the enemies are all bullet sponges to a non-communicated degree. Still, we have yet another option, don't we? Hell Raider from one of Atari's short-lived home arms, Ark. Clearly no one as Ark was red-green colourblind, because if you are, then this is not the game for you. It's neither a horizontal nor vertically scrolling shooter, but a planet crawler that reminds me a bit of Bosconian, although not as good. It's not good. But it's better than Hellraisers, at least. So maybe that's our answer. Pretend Hell Liberator Raises Hellraiser doesn't exist, and one of these is it instead. 
or ignore the lot and we'll go back for another game of Battle Squadron. On the back page, just in case there's a single person watching this video who doesn't know by this point, this year marks the 30th anniversary of Teletext Gaming Magazine Digitizer, and if you remember Teletext, the 90s, or video games, it's time to get involved. There's the second series of Digitizer The Show on the way for instance, and three specials are already on their lovely YouTube channel to watch, most notably the chance to watch original writers Mr Biffo and Mr Hares remember things about the heyday of daily video game coverage, mostly related to them being very entertaining dickheads. Also coming up, a two day celebration of all things Digi Live in Harrow this July. We'll be there, and so should you. Tickets should even be on sale now. And if that's not enough, the Digi Patreon is the best in the business. Mr Biffo grew up to be one of the country's best and most prolific TV writers, and if you're a member of the Writers Club, you'll learn so much. Please don't take the quality of my scripts as an indication. And if that's not enough, there's Marillion based podcast Between You and Me with Biffo and his wife Sanya, officially the nicest person to have ever been a Digitizer co-host. But that's not the only business. This is Yesterzine 49, so next month is our 50th issue spectacular, where we'll probably do exactly the same as every month. But maybe we'll have a surprise? Might it be the last Yesterzine ever? You'll have to watch and find out. Or wait until the end of March and see if there's a Yesterzine 51, I guess. I've not thought this through. But either way, this is the kind of information one finds out by clicking subscribe on YouTube, which has a near 50% chance of putting it on your subs feed in the app or website. And that's better than Hellraisers at least. See ya!